So today we have uh, Catherine Melcher, uh, who's the de design director for Urban Ecology, uh, which is an organization in, based in San Francisco and provides uh, technical assistance and education to uh, San Francisco Bay Area communities. And our program here at Davis has really strong ties with urban ecology historically. Actually, Stephen Wheeler uh, was a former editor of Urban Ecologist, uh, a journal that Urban Ecology had put out. I'm not sure if they continue to do that. Um, and both uh, Jeff Lux and I were also on the board of directors in the, in the uh, early to mid 90s. Uh, so we have really uh, strong ties and believe in the mission of, of urban ecology. And we're really excited to have Catherine uh, come speak uh, to, uh, with us today. So Catherine is um, a registered landscape architect and has a, a master's degree from uh, uh, LSU um, and a uh, a uh, degree in sociology from Vassar College. Uh, she's been working over 10 years uh, in practice in community development and design, both here in uh, the US, but also abroad. And she'll talk about some of those projects uh, today. Some of these community projects uh, include uh, projects uh, in the wake of the tsunami in Thailand, uh, Togo in West Africa, and um, some community-based planning work in, in San Diego. She's also on the board of directors of the uh, Community Built Association. And uh, some of you might be interested in this. She's, she's also an instructor and teaches a uh, landscape architecture certification course through a UC Berkeley Extension. And I'm, I'm sure some of you are thinking about um, uh, what it means in terms of going beyond uh, this setting and, and sitting for the exam and what additional uh, skills you might want to, to pick up. Uh, and she's also taught courses in environmental education. So she has a very sort of broad practice and background. So join me in giving a warm welcome to Catherine Melcher. I want to thank Michael for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today because in my pr practice every day I don't get a chance to look back and reflect on what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. So, so what I'm going to do today is take a look back on different projects I've done um, throughout my professional career, the path that kind of led me to my present day work at Urban Ecology, and then think about some of those thoughts and how they've developed into my work here at Urban Ecology. And as a starting point, I thought about the title of the lecture series, which is called Design is Activism. And I had a re reaction to that, and even though I think what I do is somewhat activist design, I personally don't like to see myself as being an activist. And so that's the first thought I'm going to start with and think about where that came from. So in community design, like in this picture, I'd like to see you know, the woman standing up with the stripes. Her name's Ava. To me, she's the activist. She's the parent in the school where we were designing the schoolyard, and we have Jess off to the side, who's the community designer. She's not an activist. She's listening to Eva, finding out what she wants, how she wants to change her community, and then moves forward. And where this idea for me first came home was in Africa. And when I, first, when I finished my bachelor's degree, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Togo in West Africa doing forestry work. And during that training, we talked, they talked a lot about sustainability. Um, but this was back in 1995 before sustainability was quite as big of a buzzword. And what they were really talking about was sustainability in development. So a lot of international development work, they would come in with a big idea, with lots of money, build the project, leave, and then be frustrated that whatever they built didn't continue on. So Peace Corps was very strong about, okay, you're in this community for two years, but once you leave, what's going to be left when you're gone? And they really wanted you to have the community take ownership. 
the community to say what they need, and then you figure out how to fulfill the community's needs. And they said, it's a two-year program, they said, for the first three months, don't do a project. Just sit there, meet people, learn the language, learn the customs, listen to them, listen to what their problems are, and then once those three months are done, you can start working on your project. And being an idealistic American right out of college, that was really hard to do, but we did it, and I think we got some good projects in the end. This one is working with a junior high school. Um, they wanted to learn how to start a tree nursery and outplant trees. In Africa, you have a rainy season and a dry season. And the idea is to start your tree nursery in the dry season, and then when the rains start, outplant your trees. But the problem with the dry season is you run out of water um, very quickly. So this is a shower runoff tr tree nursery. So this long line coming out comes out of the, actually it's the principal shower. So whenever they take a shower, the water runs out, runs into this big basin where they plant the tree seedlings. And then when the tree seedlings are big enough, they can outplant them when the rains start. There are two really big tensions that I dealt with in the Peace Corps, and these tensions still you know, inform my work today as a community designer. And the first one is educating versus selling. And when your people say, well, you can't just sit and listen to what the community wants because they don't know all the options that are out there in the world. They might just want to stay with what they have. And I do agree that that's a problem, but you want to be able to explain to them and bring to them all the ideas that you've experienced, but you also want to make sure that you're giving them the pros and cons and letting them make the final decision. And that can be a difficult thing because sometimes you really have a strong viewpoint about what you want and keeping that in balance. And the other one is hand-holding versus letting go. You want the project to be successful, you want it to move forward, but you also want the community to be empowered to implement the project. So how much work do you do, and how much work does the community do, and how do you make sure that they aren't feeling overwhelmed and can move forward with it? Um, I just threw this in there as an example of educating versus selling. I Sometimes, I guess, I do do the selling side and the marketing side. We also had an Earth Day event where the students acted out different plays about the importance of trees and planting trees, and that's where it kind of, you know, there's a fine line, and I'm not sure which side this falls on. So, imagine you're a community activist, and you have this great vision for what you want in your community. What, besides design, could some people shout out a few tools that you might have to, to accomplish your vision? Anybody? If you're a community activist and you say, okay, we want a park in our neighborhood, what are some of the things that you can do to get that park to happen besides design? Well, a typical community activist gets into politics a lot. They can lobby. You know, they can talk to the city council member, get the pol politicians on their side. They can run, do le letter writing, fundraising, you know, promotional marketing, and all those things come into getting their vision realized. Um, but one of the things I realized while working with design is that design is another one of those tools that the community can have to move their project forward. And in many ways, it's... To me, it's a really powerful tool because if you're just talking in words and you're talking about politics, it's very easy to be one side or the other side, and it's really hard to come to a compromise. But with design, it's a very engaging kind of process. And you have these two, you have people looking at a plan and they can start seeing how to compromise and how to work together. And this was my second thought, and it really came to life to me with my first job when I finished my landscape architecture degree, and that was at a private firm in San Diego called Estrada Land Planning. 
And in that firm, we did a lot of what you would call advocacy planning. Um, this project is a community in southeast San Diego where they had just built a great new library called the Malcolm X Library. And the community found out that across the street, they wanted to build a f food distribution plant. And the community was upset. They went to their city council member and said, we don't want this in our, what we consider our village center. And he basically said, well, if you don't like it, come up with a better plan. And you'd be surprised how often that happens. And so they said, OK, and they hired us to come up with what they considered a better plan. This is another example of something like that that happened. This is in Chula Vista, which is just south of San Diego, or south of downtown San Diego. And it's the Port of San Diego did a master plan for the development on the ocean front. And they hired a firm from New York City to come in and do the plan and was very much focused on the economic development side of things and putting in high-rise hotels. The, a nonprofit called the Environmental Health Coalition uh, did, didn't think that this plan was very good because there is some sensitive habitat, a lot of sensitive habitat along the way. And so they hired our firm again to come up with an alternative plan. And the final plan wasn't the alternative plan, the Environmental Health Coalition plan, but they did take in some of the ideas like putting a buffer zone between the development and the wetlands and preserving some of the views straight through to the ocean. And this final planning project that I included, uh, it's the San Ysidro border crossing and that's between San Diego and Tijuana. It's the largest land border crossing in the US. And I used it to show that advocacy planning isn't always the good side versus the bad side. It's not always black versus white. Um, this one, the federal government, the General Services Administration, wanted to come up with some plans for expanding the border crossing. And I think they came up with about four alternatives. Another local nonprofit group came up with a couple more alternatives. And then, but then, their alternatives focused kind of on the left, moved the crossing to the left side of this map, where there's kind of big box stores and strip malls. We were hired by the business association, which most of their businesses are on the right side of the map, where you see the yellow dot is the trolley stop, and it's a very pedestrian friendly, and the orange dot is the pedestrian crossing currently. So this business association didn't want the pedestrian crossing to move all the way across to the other side because they were afraid they'd lose their business. So they hired us to come up with some other alternative plans. And I'm, I mean, I personally don't even know which side was the right side. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. It's not always the community's voice versus the developer's voice. So another thing that came up with working with all these different communities is I realized that people really are intuitive designers. You do need to explain you know, some basics. You need to watch and make sure you're not using a lot of jargon when you're talking to them. But when it comes down to it, we all design things. You know, we all think about how our house is arranged. We all think about what we wear when, when we get up in the morning. And people really can be engaged in the design, no matter what their education background is, no matter what their, um, and this is where that really came home to me, was in Thailand. Um, after the tsunami hit this um, small Muslim village, the Peace Corps came to the village and said, how can we help? What do you need? And the leaders of the village said, well, we've already rebuilt our houses. We're already, we think we're pretty back on track, but there are a lot more children living in this neighborhood because they've moved in from where the tsunami hit, and we'd really like to have a safe place for them to play. We'd really like to have a playground. So the Peace Corps advertised and asked for a volunteer to come help them design and build a playground, and I was lucky enough to get that opportunity. But then I showed up there, and I knew no tie. I was unfamiliar with their culture. 
I wasn't quite sure where to begin. But I just went back to my design background and started with a design charrette. Um, we made sure that it was very visual. We had pictures of all the elements that we, that we wanted and just asked them to arrange the elements, all the different choices that you could have for your playground on the map. And I was blown away by how engaged they, they became in this process. Um, their typical meeting is you know, rows of chairs, people sitting, and one person lecturing to them. That's how their schooling is as well. And to see them you know, break up into these small groups and get really engaged and excited was uh, a real exciting moment. And you know, I'd like to also make sure that there's options for other things. So I told them, you know, here's a blank piece of paper. Write something else on it if you don't see it there. And they took advantage of that and wrote, the women decided that they wanted a place where they could do aerobics in private. And again, just showing how to use pictures. And I did have translators to help with this as well. It wasn't. So then the next step was building the playground. And I had some local carpenters who had never seen a playground like this before, but were very skilled and very enthusiastic. And so it was a great you know, give and take back and forth. I would show them my drawings and talk to them about why I was doing what I was doing. And they would suggest ideas of how to make it better and how to make it fit right. And overall, it worked really well. I also had a carpenter from England who just showed up because he wanted to do volunteer work after the tsunami. And he gave advice. And one day, I was debating with the carpenters about something and about what, whether we should, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And I turned to the British carpenter and I asked him. And he's, he just kind of shrugged and he said, well, it'll look fine from my house. And that was my, my next lesson. You know, sometimes, I don't think it's an ego thing. Some people say, oh, designers have these egos. But when you're a designer, you get excited about your ideas. You get excited about design. And every once in a while, when you're a community designer, you have to step back and say, oh, yeah, they have great ideas, and you need to know when to let go. Uh, I would say that I don't let go when it comes to issues of safety and also functionality. Those are some things that I don't compromise on. But you know, the general idea is it is their place, and I'm back here. I don't have to live with that playground every day, and they do. So those are some of their ideas going into the playground. We had a local artist who came in and painted. And then we also um, asked the kids to paint rocks that we used to line the edges of the playground. So that comes to my final thought. And that's, to me, the success is when the project is really owned by the community. And they feel free to take it and use it the way that they want to use it. And I think all those other thoughts build into that, you know, where I'm not the activist, where we're using design as a tool, and then we're open to adapting the plan as things move forward. And I was really thrilled to see in this project how the playground really became a part of their life. Whether it was your kids eating dinner on the playground, the ice cream man, putting it on their, his regular route. Uh, another neighbor set up a whole snack stand to sell snacks and drinks to the kids while they're at the playground. And then just the kids coming in. This was one day before the playground was even completed, and they're all climbing all over it. And then at the end of the day, they put up this little sign. And I asked them what it said, and they said, it says bicycle parking. So that's something I didn't think to put in the design. So that takes me to what I do now at Urban Ecology. And when we're through with this, we can have a broader discussion about Urban Ecology and what they've done over the years. Uh, it's, we're about 33 years old. We're a nonprofit planning and design firm. And we work with communities in the Bay Area to try to find ways for them to improve 
their lives and how they could be activists and how design can be a tool to help them. Uh, it started, and when I say I'm not an activist, but actually urban ecology in many ways is an activist organization and has done um, in the past. It started in Berkeley with some architects who had a strong vision for how can we bring ecology back into the city and how can um, it be more of a balance with nature and city life. And you can see in the front there's this car with vegetables growing in the back and that was one of the first projects that, that they had. And one of the projects that they're best known for is the Blueprint for a Sustainable Bay Area and that takes a regional look at sustainability and what can happen regionally as the Bay Area moves forward. And that's definitely um, providing a vision, which is to me an activist position. And more recently, another project we've been working on is something called the East Bay Greenway. And it's looking at the BART tracks in Oakland, going from about 18th Avenue to Hayward, and saying, underneath those BART tracks, can't we put in something for the communities that it runs through, like a pedestrian bicycle path. So this is what that area looks like right now. And this is a vision for what it really could be. Um, the project that I'd like to spend more time talking about is the Oakland Schoolyards Initiative that we've been working on for about the past three years. It's, the pilot project is with four schools in Oakland, two, two elementary schools and two middle schools. And as you can see on the map, the red dots show where the schools are and you can see where the poverty in Oakland is concentrated. And then you can see faintly the green areas which is where most of the open space is. And so obviously these areas where there's high poverty, they're also lacking in access to open space. And then the open space that they do have looks like this. This is Garfield Park, which is next to Garfield Elementary School. It's locked and gated. And if you're, a if you're a baseball group, you can get permission to open it and the school can use it, but that's about it. And Oakland recommends that every community have four acres of open space per thousand residents, and this community only has 0.78 acres. Uh, one of the reasons why the parks are gated and locked is the problem of crime. The white dots are where these schools are that we're working. And crime is a serious issue that we have to deal with in all our designs and all our work. And it's easy to say, oh, we'll activate the space and then, you know, It'll, everything will be okay. And that is one part of the solution, but it's a much bigger problem and it's something that design cannot alone solve. So I'm gonna talk mostly about Garfield Elementary, which was the first school that we worked at. Um, the school district had money to modernize the building. And as you can see in this picture, it looks really great. And the parents said, well, you have this money to improve the building. What can you do for the schoolyard? And the school district um, said, well, we don't have any money right now. Show us a plan and we'll see what you can do. And so that goes back to very similar to the project I had in San Diego where the city council member said, well, come up with a plan and we'll see what we can do. So they hired Urban Ecology to come up with a plan. And our planning process, we made sure we involved all the parents and we worked with the students on the design and we also worked a lot with the staff and these are the middle school students getting involved in the design and the middle school we also um, got this a student leadership team to lead the design process for the rest of the students and this guy in the middle is Eric who is one of our student leaders and at the end of the the whole design. He wrote us a thank you letter and said that he's decided that he now wants to be an architect. So, and to me that that, you know, community design isn't just about the design, it's also about moments like that. So people 
in this process, we found that people are intuitive designers. We had this community where Garfield is, there's, I think, 35 different languages spoken in the neighborhood. The school itself, 80% of the students are English language learners. So the meetings that we had, we had five official languages that were being translated at the same time. But they all managed to get involved in the design and discuss. And what surprised me going into it was working with elementary school students. I wasn't sure how much they could get into the design. And I was working with these students. So I was being very careful saying, OK, here's the map figure out where your classroom is, where do you think the cafeteria is, and getting them used to reading maps, because I didn't know how much they'd been reading maps. But I was surprised at how quickly they knew where everything was. And then we had another group come in. A little kid ran up to me and looked, took one look at the map. He said, oh, is that a Google map? And I realized that you know, things might be changing how we see and how we design and the tools that we have. So after all that, we came up with a plan, and this is one where we were talking about implementation, and we didn't have the money to implement the plan. We asked the parents what were the priorities, what really needed to be done, and then we started working with them, trying to figure out how to advocate for it to change. And we got the students involved, and the top priority was just repaving the schoolyard. And uh, I love these things. This is Calvin. He says, people can trip on the cracks, and there's a rumor that you step on a crack and you break your mom's back. <laughs> and then he wrote another one. He said, a crack-free school will make life better. If they filled all the cracks, it would be great. And that's another reason why I'm not an activist. I cannot say it better than Calvin can. So, so we had a teacher very involved in the school, and for one of her English classes, she had everybody write letters to the school um, district facilities director explaining how they really needed to repave the yard. We had the parents meeting with the school district telling them, again, how they really needed to pave the yard. We had the principal calling the school district and talking to them. Um, we also had, we were lucky to have the school board president involved, and he took this, the facilities director out for sushi and talked to him. And then we also had a lot of outside grants that said we are going to, we can pay for some of the improvements if the school district provides some matching grants. And lo and behold, the school district agreed to repave the yard. And depending on who you talk to, everybody has a different reason why the school district decided to repave the yard. You ask the school board president, he said, oh, it's because of the sushi. If you ask, um, urban Ecology Executive Director is like, oh, it's because of the outside funding. If you ask this, you know, the school, they say, oh, it's the principal and the students. And that, I think, is the symptom of a successful project, where you don't have one person who's an activist who's making it happen. You have the whole, everybody involved in it. So then we got the yard paved, and we had to figure out what else to do. So our implementation kind of became a piecemeal approach, where we had the school district repaving and putting in the basketball courts. And then we had a series of volunteer days for the gardening and for painting. And then we also got some outside funding for benches and trees. And that's some of the volunteer days that we had. And so during these volunteer days, I was very much reminded of the British carpenter who said, it looks fine from my house. We were out there, and we put in our four square, and we were ready to go. And the PE teacher came in and said, we don't want 12 foot four square. We want 18 feet. So we changed it on the spot. And another PE teacher came out and said, we need 40 dots spaced like this so the students can stand and do exercises. And I'm not sure why that didn't get into the plan in the first place, but we managed to rearrange it again and put them in. And you know, who says that hopscotch has to be read left to right? Yeah. And this is at another school. This is Urban Promise Academy, where we had a planting volunteer day. And 
I put this in to remember, even though you have to let go, you also have to have a very good plan because when 60 middle school students come up, show up and they're ready to plant plants, you have to have some kind of idea of where they're going. And it won't, at the end of the day, it won't be exactly your plan, but it'll be a lot less than the chaos. And that's actually the truck that brought the plants and it kind of reminded me of the original veggie car. So there's kind of a theme for urban ecology. So this work at Garfield has been going on for three years and we're still not done. We um, still have a lot of benches to put in and some trees and it's not really a design that I think is going to win any design awards. But then thinking back to my thought, success to me really isn't about design awards. It's about the community making the place its own. And this is one indication at Garfield that maybe that's happening. We decided to paint a nice rainbow entryway. We decided a rainbow because it would be something easy, you know, straight lines for the volunteers to paint. The kids saw it and immediately turned it into a racetrack, a running track. And to me, that's really the joy and the magic of doing community design, and that's why I do it. So, thank you. So we have enough time for some dialogue and some questions and answers. So um, I don't know if it wants to kick off with a question. I mean, I have, I have at least 10 questions I want to uh, ask, but I think this is a great opportunity to begin, to begin more of a dialogue. Uh, we've been pressed for time in uh, previous presentations, but um, um, this is an opportunity to, to go a little bit more in depth, I think, in the types of things you're thinking about, this type of practice. Uh, what types of skills that, uh, that are, are, are good to, to gain, not only uh, in school, but out, out on these sites and these types of, this type of work. So, who would like to ask the first question? Um, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about working with the school community to do these designs. Um, so if they're happening over a span of a few years, it seems like you would have stakeholders sort of coming in and out, right, as their kids pass through the various schools. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that was like a, a big deal that you had to work around as opposed to a neighborhood project where you have a more stable population you're working on, perhaps. It is, it has been an issue on, on many different levels. There's um, kids who we worked at, at the middle school and we said it'll take three years for you to implement this design and they're upset to hear that, you know, they won't be there for it, but then we remind them, well, you're doing it for your brothers and sisters. Um, one kid said, well, when are you going to go to the high school and do a design there? So that's another option. There is also the problem with staff turnover and um, principals, new principals coming in. So we try to make, once we have the design finished, we try to get it approved by the school and by the school district. So then the new principal comes on board and realizes that everybody's already agreed to um, what they have. But then we also try to be flexible again, like I showed with the PE teachers coming in and saying, well, we want something a little different from what you had already planned. Yeah. I'm actually curious about the work you did in San Diego, specifically the choice of marketing that just as far as who you approach by what their group's objective for that area. Okay, so the, the first project, the, yeah, the, um, so that, that was another point that I didn't bring in, but partnering with community-based organizations is really key to a successful project. And in that project, there's a group called the Jacobs Center, which is a nonprofit that works in that community and helps, um, helps community development. And they brought in the first grocery store and other things. And so they were working with the community on this issue, and they hired us to come up with that land use plan. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit comparatively uh, between the work you've done here in the U.S. in the Bay Area and San Diego versus the work in other countries? Uh, and some of the things that you've picked up culturally, 
uh, that are important lessons to know? Are there a lot of similarities or differences that, that you were able to glean from those experiences? I think there are a lot more similarities than you expect. And I think that's what I was trying to say with going into that group in Thailand that was very different culture, very different language, very different expectations, and not exposed to landscape architecture at all. And they got into that exercise and were just really enthusiastic. Um, I think for me the biggest difference I've been feeling is kind of the regulations and the concern for liability in America where the project at Garfield took three years, the project in Thailand took half a year and some of that is just having to make sure that everybody's on board and there's a lot more people that you have to check in with. It does raise this, this issue of uh, these type of small-scale projects, assuming that uh, public welfare and safety issues are addressed, that, you know, do you think that we, there should be some loosening up of regulations, especially if these projects are also part of community building activities? Mm -hmm. I know, for example, in certain uh, immigrant communities that use space differently, that have different um, attachments to how space is used, how they build things, a more incremental approach, which really flies in the face of the type of regulations that uh, we tend to see. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that there's some room for some, some change there? Or? Um, I don't think I'm experienced enough to, to give a definitive. Mm -hmm. That's an area that I'm very interested in, and I'm interested in doing more of that. That's why I'm on the board of the Community Built Association where there are certain playground companies, like there's Leathers Associates is one, where they come in to the community and they do, uh, they build the playground with the community and they do that in America and to all the regulations. Mm -hmm. And, but so far with the schoolyards, we've been holding back, we've just, the volunteer stuff has been the very basic, the painting, the planting, the things that aren't liability, but as I develop, I personally, and I don't know if this, is, this isn't necessarily urban ecology, I'd like to figure out more about those issues and what, how much the community actually can build. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, you learn a lot from just sitting back and listening and people would ask me what I do and I would explain to them and then they would decide whether or not they wanted to work with me and they would approach me instead of my coming out there and saying, hey, this is a great idea, everybody, you should do it. Because when you do that, then you're not, not quite sure if they're just doing it because they want to be your friend, because you're the white person and American and they want to get to know you, or do they really feel like this is a great idea? And also in that situation, I felt very uncomfortable coming in and teaching people about forestry and farming when they're, you know, they've been farming for generations. That's what they do. That's their life. And I'm not a farmer. And so it was it felt much more comfortable to me to sit back and listen, hear what they need, and then go try to see where those resources are that I could bring in to help them. And yeah, I think almost all projects, I like to sit back and I like to listen, and some of that's my personality, but I think that makes a much more successful community project. And I definitely, I tried to do that in Thailand as well. So talk a little bit about your, your, your training as a landscape architect. Uh, m most of the folks in this room now are going through that process. Um, is there anything in your training that either uh, helped or actually served as a hindrance in doing this type of work? <laughs> um, my, my background, I got my master's from Louisiana State University. And it was a very good, very broad background, very useful. and. People have different opinions, but I really felt like having those years in San Diego working for a private firm 
I think that helped me a lot understand how cities work, how offices work, the whole structure. And there's, quite honestly, there's not a lot of jobs out there for nonprofit landscape architects. And so to be able to have that background and get enough experience to be licensed makes me more marketable for nonprofits who might not be able to train you the way that a private firm can. Were there any particular courses that you took uh, in a, outside of or as part of your master's degree that um, really, once you knew that this was some of the type of work that you wanted to do, that kind of moved that forward a bit or no? Well, my first degree was in sociology. So obviously the sociology classes and thinking about social change and how to, you know, I, I went into it with the idea I wanted to make the world a better place and in sociology, we kept on learning about all these policies that, well, this is why this policy is not working. This is why this policy is not working. And so that's why I kind of started going towards forestry and then which turned into landscape architecture because I realized, well, you know, if you plant a tree, that's something that you've done that you can see that's tangible. And that's what I like about landscape architecture is it's something that's tangible while you can talk about policy a lot and not see things. Um, when I took my landscape architecture degree, um, I can't think of specific classes really. But it's just it's mostly design focused. Good. Great. Question back there. Uh, I know one of your things was letting go of a project, but do you work with the group while you're designing it, talking about what's it going to take to keep this project up? And do you do follow ups in here? later to see if your projects are being maintained and any sort of instruction on, you know, particularly like with the, the school district, they probably don't have a lot of maintenance to yeah. follow up on that. So clearly the parents or the students really need to participate in keeping that going. I'm just kind of curious what your um, reaction to yeah, that's, follow that's, up is. Yeah, that's very true. And when, when I'm saying letting go, I don't mean I just let things go. I mean that there's always this tension within myself thinking, oh, should I be letting go or should I be stepping forward to take things on? And I think that is one way that as a nonprofit community designer that we are different from private firms because private firms, when you're done with the contract, you're done. Um, but we tried to keep with, as you saw, we tried to keep with the school and keep with them while they're implementing it. And we've had a lot of talks about maintenance and how to get, we also partner with the after school programs. And so how do we get the programming involved and what they're doing on the schoolyard and how to get, how to work that into also keeping it maintained and lively. And the designs might not be as fancy as we'd like. And some of that is also out of concern for maintenance. But with this, the Urban Promise Planting Day, we had a garden committee that kind of organized the whole volunteer day. And then when it was done, they decided to keep going. And so they're taking the responsibility of watering the plants and weeding. And so. It's part of that, you know, educating the kids is there's the construction part and then there's the maintenance part of it too. Whether it's your own garden or something else, it's part of the education process. Yeah, and if the kids are out there planting, they want to see their plant stay alive. So it's. Any other questions for Catherine? Let's thank her again for... Okay. Thank you. Oh, hi. Yes.